Well, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. And as you're turning there, I want to highlight what we're talking about today. We're going to talk again about communion. In fact, I'm going to talk about uh, four things related to taking communion in particular. And uh, we're going to talk about how that applies to all Christians, regardless of your tradition that you come from. So how the scripture teaches all Christians. And as I head into reading the passage this morning, I want to acknowledge the obvious. We're coming out of a a four-message series on the Reformation, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And one of those things that I briefly mentioned but never didn't talk in any detail about was that one of the big points of contention in the Reformation was what the different churches that broke away from the Reformed or from the Roman Catholic Church, including the Roman Catholic Church itself, how they all had differences of opinion about taking and participating in communion. And those differences still exist today. And one of the things that I've noticed in interacting with people through the years, people who are thinking about joining the church or people who end up having uh, questions about what we believe, especially if they come from other traditions, or even those who've been around the church for a long time, is that people easily confuse, listen carefully to this, people easily confuse the importance of the preferential things we choose to do when we practice communion versus what communion means for everybody. Let me illustrate it this way. Lots of people, for example, have asked me through the years, they've gotten hung up on the frequency of communion. And it's a core conviction for some. I mean, for example, some people think it should be done weekly. And you may be surprised to hear this, some of you. Some people think it should not be done more often than every three months. And you're like, well, why? I'll talk about that in a minute. Some people would prefer to do it daily if they could or somewhere in between there, right? So the question becomes, is the frequency with which we take communion spoken of in the Bible? you'll find that the answer to that question is no in one sense. It's not prescribed how often. And you'll see in the passage we're going to read where it says, as often as you do this. So communion should be practiced frequently, but there's no prescribed frequency, if you will, but people do get hung up on that. Let me give another example. What kind of bread should you use? Don't shout out the answer you think it should be. (laughs) Some of you think, you know, it should be bread without yeast. Some of you think it should be Wonder Bread because that's what you grew up on at church, (laughs) right? Or everything in between. Well, let me do a poll. I didn't ask for responses in the first service. How many of you know for a fact when you were growing up and you, at your church, they had Wonder Bread? That was communion bread, Wonder Bread. Anybody? At least one. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. How many of you, we can get hung up on these things. It's kind of like in the old days we used to joke that people thought it was named in the Bible what color the carpet in the sanctuary should be, for example, right? So we can get hung up on all the lesser things and forget the main thing. Today I want to talk about the main thing. And I want you to, not only today, I want, but in, in subsequent messages as well as we talk through things like this, I want you to begin to distinguish the difference between what you prefer and, and what applies to everybody. For example, one last moment, today you're going to be asked to come forward and receive communion. Some people prefer that. Others of you do not. It is not a point of division. It's a point of preference. And today we ask you to participate with us as we've made this preferential choice. You see the difference. All right, with that, let's read the scripture. We're going to talk about communion today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm beginning in verse 23, and we'll read through verse 29. Paul, teaching his fellow believers in a place called Corinth, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is the word of the Lord. And as I said... What I want to talk about this morning is four aspects of taking communion that apply to everybody, regardless of your Christian tradition, regardless of the background you came from. So the first thing I want to mention is from verse 28. Notice what it says again. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let me make a comment here. Everyone. Now clearly he's talking to the people in the church that he's written the letter to. But I think there's an aspect here that that we need to remind ourselves that everyone applies to believers and non-believers. What I've discovered is that people regardless of their faith background don't spend a lot of time examining their hearts, examining their motives, and examining their weaknesses, and examining their needs. They just kind of stuff it down and pretend it's not there. People drift through life only thinking about today, not spending any time really doing any of the important work, if you will, the soul work of examining what's going on inside of ourselves so that we can understand why we do what we do. So I really think this admonition applies to everybody. I think it applies to every single one of you just as much as it applies to me. Examine yourself. Do not take lightly the opportunities you have in life to sit down and examine yourself. So what do I want to say about that? The first thing that applies then uh, of a thought about taking communion is that it is just as important to examine ourselves before we take communion as it is to actually participate in taking communion. Now, as I say that, I want to point out that if there's one error I observe in most of the Christians I know, regardless of whether or not they're in this church or in other churches, the error when it comes to examining ourselves before we take communion, the place where we would err is that we, we are not hyper-focused. In other words, we don't over-examine ourselves. We under-examine ourselves. Don't raise your hands right now. Okay? But I'm asking a question. I really want you to, th- to think quickly about the answer to the question. I think you're going to be able to answer quickly. How many of you spent time this week spiritually examining your hearts knowing that we were taking communion this Sunday? Now, my guess is if you raised your hand, you would be joined by the great majority of the folks seated next to you. Why? Because it's human nature. It's human nature to fall into routines. It's human nature to take things for granted. It's human nature to go through the motions. It's human nature to just drift along. The reason why I think the Lord gave this to us is because he he knows that about us. He knows that about our sin nature. He knows that about ourselves that we don't want to look at ourselves. We don't want to look deeply We want to just blow past moments like this. But the Lord really wants us to do the hard work. And by the way, I think a lot of you are like me. When I'm in the context of a worship service, I'm, I'm examining my heart. That's great. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing the hard work before you get into the room. For what reason? Well, the primary reason comes from another place where I could look where Paul talked to a group of people and he said, listen, he's preaching and, and we find this, this sermon in, in Acts 24 and he says to the group of people he's preaching to, he says, listen, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. 
Why ultimately is God wanting you to examine yourselves? Because he wants to invite you to have a clear conscience. He wants you to take inventory. He wants you to look hard at yourself and take stock of where you're at. Not just in your progress towards your goals, but in the, in the state of your soul. How's your heart? How's your heart life? You know? So let me give you three suggestions of ways that you can examine yourself as you think about next month's communion. The first one uh, I learned in our Celebrate Recovery ministry and I share it with you, it's such a great question. You do a heart check, right? And you ask yourself, you, I mean, you literally sit down with a piece of paper, and I mentioned journaling at the end, so I'll just say it now. You sit down with your journal, and you can literally put on each moment or each section, you know, section it out on the paper, am I, am I hurting right now for any reason? Now, let me state the obvious on this. I'm not talking about, well, yeah, my knee's a little sore today. No. What am I talking about? Is my spirit hurting? Have I been wounded by somebody or something? Am I hurting inside? And by the way, notice the question is not designed in such a way that you're able to explain why you're hurting. It's meant for you to identify whether or not your heart hurts. And by the way, also, I, I'm going to stop saying by the way, by the way. Um, <laughs> something happens spiritually as you are allowing in that moment the Holy Spirit to sift you. Now, as you're going through this list, you go through, am I hurting? And then you go through, am I exhausted? Am I tired? Because how many of you recognize that when you're tired, you're at your worst? And I just want to say this as humbly as I can, um, because it's not about me, but the way I've experienced it through other people some of the times where I've had the greatest disappointments and the greatest hurts in being a pastor is when I've run into exhausted people. Because exhausted people have this universal ability to think in their tiredness to be frantic and, and to think you know, critically and then to attack forcefully. Now, when I say that I've been hurt by exhausted people, I don't want to pretend that I'm not also at my worst when I'm exhausted. As I've always told people when this subject comes up, uh, this is why my mom used to tell me when I was cranky as a little boy, uh, do you think it's time for a nap? <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, of course it was. <laughs> right? It was amazing too. I'd go in and I, I would try to be obstinate and read a book and not fall asleep, and then I'd fall asleep and be amazingly refreshed. Afterward, can anyone relate to that? Yeah, sometimes the best thing you could do is take a nap. Amen? What about when you're angry? Naps are good then too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> am I angry? What am I angry about? You know, one of the greatest reasons for anger is that things don't go the way we want them to go. Not what, get this now, James talks about this if you read through the book of James. It's not what I expected. And I get angry. Same thing with resentful. Uh, it took me a lot of years to realize this, but one of the reasons I d developed resentments was because it's a 10th commandment thing. What's 10th commandment? Anybody know? Thou shalt not covet, which means want what others have. You become resentful because someone else has something you want. And I'm not just talking about material possessions. Become resentful. Or that last one, am I tense? Like the scripture says, anxious for nothing. Now, can I also say this? When you do a heart check on yourself, you need to set aside time where you can actually do this, where the Holy Spirit can interact with you without outside interruptions. Interruptions. 
Yes, I am suggesting that you should turn your cell phone off and leave it behind. Take your Bible with you. It won't hurt you to do that. I know you like some of you are in that thing like I do sometimes. I just want my, bio, my you know, look up a verse on my, on my phone. Leave the phone behind. Set aside uninterrupted time. This is not something that, that happens quickly. I, I, I love this metaphor. This is not my metaphor. Someone else used it. But if you're going to do a heart check on yourself, it is not a microwavable moment. It's crock pot. Right? Does that make sense? It takes time. And it takes regular practice. Notice as well, I said this when we went through the Fruit of the Spirit series in the summer. You could take the list of the Fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and just pray through those right alongside the heart check. Where's my love for others? Am I joyful? Am I experiencing peace? You know, allowing the Holy Spirit to sift you, something happens when you do this. This is what Paul is talking about. Examine yourself before you take communion. Now, why? All right, let me read verses 23 then and through 26 again. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. This is not his words. These are the words of Jesus. This is what I pass on. The Lord Jesus, on the night is betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you, and then read that with me, do this in remembrance of me. And notice the rest of it. In this same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, and say that with me, in remembrance of me. So what are we doing? As we examine, these two things go hand in hand. We're also taking time to reflect and remember Christ's sacrifice of his body and his blood and that it's vital and necessary for our spiritual health. Let me say it another way. Christ, you need to remember that Christ had to die for you. That what you need the most, you cannot produce. You cannot fix yourself. There's an emptiness and a God-sized hole inside of you that only Jesus can fill. And that God-sized hole has led us astray. Like Jeremiah said, our hearts are deceitful above all else. If we trust our heart, we will be led astray. We will fall into brokenness. We'll fall into problems. So we need to remember that it was necessary that Jesus do what he did. There was no other way. If there had been another way, Jesus would have found it. He would have done that. Instead, he went willingly to the cross. That's why he says, on that last night, you can read in any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, He breaks the bread and he hands it to them. And he says to the disciples, and by extension to us, that's what Paul is saying, this is my body broken for you. There was no other way. Do this now in remembrance of that fact. No other way also says no other way to God. Jesus is saying, I am the way. There was no other way to God except through me. This is my body broken for you. There was no other way. Do it in remembrance of me. And then afterwards, he takes the cup, and he shares it with them, and he says, this is my blood. This is my blood shed for you. And the Bible's unequivocally clear on this, Old Testament and New Testament. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. What do we remember? That it was necessary that Jesus sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God, the one Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Or you can personalize it and say, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away Greg's sin. Put your own name there. It was necessary. And Jesus says to you, and Paul reminds you, and I remind you again this morning, as Christians have done through the ages, it was necessary for Jesus to die for you. Remember that. John Calvin says, communion was ordained to be frequently used among all Christians in order that they might frequently return in memory to Christ's passion. By such remembrance to sustain and strengthen their faith and to urge themselves to sing thanksgiving to God and to proclaim his goodness. It's not something we should take lightly. It's something we should do regularly. Now look back at verse 26. Notice again he says, For who, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And what I want to say is this. Partaking of the bread and the cup is the pledging of ourselves to the mission of God. What do I mean by that? This is one of those points where people confuse the difference between communion and baptism. I've heard plenty of stories And by the way, if you've done this, just know there's grace of God for you too in this deal, right? I've heard plenty of stories where people have grown up in the church, gotten baptized, went off and lived a crazy reckless life, even renouncing their faith, and then coming back and receiving Christ again, and then thinking they needed to be baptized again. Because the first time didn't work. Now, I'm... I'm pointing out an exaggeration for a reason. Why? Baptism is not your pledge of allegiance. It's God's pledge of allegiance to you. I will never leave you or forsake you. This is about the Holy Spirit's commitment to chase you down because just to just this fact, you did not love God first. God first loved you. And every time you observe a baptism from now on, I want you to remember, you would not be there praising God if not for the grace of God given to you by the Holy Spirit. We proclaim his name because the Spirit has worked in us. We only need to be baptized once to be reminded of that. And some of you get hung up on whether or not you remember actually being baptized. If you see a baptism and you have been baptized... You are participating in the reality of a baptism because the Holy Spirit is poured out on everyone by faith when we see the sign of the water. But what is communion about specifically? If baptism is about God's pledge to us, if you will, to love us first and bring us to faith, communion is about our response to what God has done and pledging allegiance to him. Every single time we participate in it. What are you committing? Because here's one of those places we take lightly, communion. We are committing ourselves again to his mission. That Jesus has chosen you. He's chosen me to be a part of sharing his love, acceptance, and forgiveness with a hurting world that he so loves. He's chosen us to be pastors to the people that he's put in our lives. He's chosen us to be the one who love them and care for them and pray for them and and reach out to them. He's chosen you. He's chosen me to be a part of his, his method, if you will, of sharing. And by the way, there is no plan B. That's plan A. That's the only plan there is. You and I participating in his death and resurrection and sharing our hope with a world that needs it. And every time you come forward, you're recommitting to that. You're recommitting to his people. How many of you know you're sitting around some pretty messed up people right now? How many of you know you're pretty messed up, right? Yeah. And this messed up motley crew is the one that God chose. And we recommit ourselves to to this less than perfect group with certainly less than perfect pastors. And we walk together as a family of brokenness redeemed by the one who saved us. 
Listen, we're not trying to have people look at us and see how great we are. We're trying to get people to look at Jesus and see how great he is. That's what this whole thing's about. And you recommit to that. And, and like I said a couple of weeks ago when we talked about, you know, welcoming new members, this is the family of God. How many of you know family can be hard? Right? Maybe even a little dysfunctional. Yes, with all of its blemishes, with all of its warts, and all of its beauty, we recommit ourselves to that which Jesus died for. Do not ever disparage the bride of Christ. For as imperfect as she is, she is the one that Jesus chose. She's not always going to behave perfectly, but the one who loves her will. And we recommit ourselves ultimately to the bride, to the church, because of the one who loves the bride. Last thing I want to say. Look at, if you will, verse 29. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink. (laughs) What's that word there? Judgment. Judgment. They eat and drink judgment on themselves. Owie. Not fun. What do we mean by that? Well, actually, it's pretty clear. Let me say this first to anyone who does not yet believe. Let's suppose you're here for the first time this morning, and you're hearing a sermon about communion, and you know you don't believe, so you're trying to figure out, actually, this is one of the best mornings you could have come. Because we're explaining something Jesus told us to do to illustrate what matters most. And let's suppose for a minute you don't believe, and when everyone gets ready to come forward a little later in the service, you might feel awkward if you don't also come forward. Because you'd be worried about who might notice that you haven't come forward. I want you to know that one of the things this scripture is teaching is this. Do not feel obligated to take communion if you don't yet believe. And Jesus is okay with it in that sense. In fact, I I would believe I'm safe in saying this, that it's preferred that you not come forward and receive communion until you've said yes to Jesus. God is unequivocally clear on this in the Old and New Testament. There are no points for looking like you believe. What God really cares about, and what I've noticed about a lot of people who don't believe, atheists or otherwise, people just struggling, they really care about integrity. Did you know God cares about integrity too? So you are good. But also know this. Today could be the day. Because the beautiful thing about this is you deserve judgment, I deserve judgment, all people deserve judgment because we've harmed ourselves by disobeying God. Now, most people don't say it like that. They don't explain it like that. They don't think like that. But the truth is we have harmed ourselves. And Jesus saves us from that. He restores us to an inheritance that our hearts tell us we always were entitled to, but somehow had lost. And if you dare to believe that Jesus came because he loves you, he accepts you in spite of what you've done to others, in spite of what you've done to yourself, and in spite of what you've left undone, He accepts you in spite of all that stuff and more and forgives you through Jesus' broken body and shed blood on the cross. If you have come to the point where you dare to believe that that might really be the answer to the universe, then come forward and receive the bread and the cup. And Jesus says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Because you know what? There's something spiritually significant
about asking Jesus into our heart. And there's something spiritually significant then about taking his broken body and his shed blood and placing them into our mouth. Something is happening there. There's no other way to explain it. So that's why I say there's something spiritually significant. Beyond explanation. Now this is where I want to close and say lots of people get hung up on, well, is is that actually the body and the blood of Christ? Is it symbolically the, bo- the blood and the body of Christ? You're in a church that loves to embrace the mystery. We're not really sure. <laughs> but something important is happening there. These folks might be right. It might be purely symbolic. These folks might be right. We're not sure. We just know Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We just know that when we take the cup, Jesus said, this is my blood. This is a promise to you that I'll be with you. And by the way, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood, which means it's a new promise of being included in the family. So who cares what actually is going on? We just know something is going on. And we participate in what Jesus is doing by trusting in the one who made the promise. We don't dare to divide over that. Instead, we embrace and realize there's something happening here. And regardless of what you personally understand, if you trust in the promise of the one who made it to you, receive it with thanksgiving.